Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is uh, Wednesday, February 16th. The time is approximately 1.10. Um, we met, let the record show there is a quorum present. And members, this is a hybrid um, hearing. So just a couple tips on your computers. Um, please press the F1 and keep muted. Uh, if, you, if you're in the room, please, you'll use your microphones at the table and do not un unmute your computers. Um, and with that, um, everyone around, the, the, the um, microphones are very sensitive. So if you have a sidebar conversation, please take it um, outdoors, uh, out the doors. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, welcome to the committee. Today we have three bills up. The first bill is Senate file 2668. Um, as it is my bill, um, I, will, I will hand the gavel over to Senator Weber to chair. Senator Weber. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and I believe it's 2768, correct? Okay, very good. Um, 2768 is before us. Uh, Senator Rood has the A4 amendment. This would be an author's amendment. Uh, any comments you care to make to it, Senator Rood? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, simply a technical uh, amendment to clean up some wording that we had. Um, very good. All those in favor of the, uh, well, actually, Senator Rood moves A4 amendment. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion's carried. Thank you. Please proceed, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate file uh, 2768 is the Certified Salt Applicator Program. Uh, we've been working on this program for quite, quite, a, uh, a, quite a while. And uh, it's a very exciting program. And although we have not passed the bill, we feel we have made great strides in um, keeping the salt uh, from going into our, our lakes and streams. Currently, Minnesota has 50 chloride impaired waters and about 75 additional ones that are right on the border. And so what we're attempting to do here is really educate the public on the use of salt um, in our environment, whether it's on the roads or whether it is a uh, uh, management company using salt um, for the sidewalks. And we think that uh, the education is really the key in this bill. Um, we all have been working, those of us that have been working, I know I'm not gonna take away Sue's um, thunder there, um, but we, we really think we've made great strides. In Crow Wing County, um, we now have yearly training for our snow, snow um, plow drivers. And I took the training myself. It's very educational. They wouldn't let me drive the truck, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was very educational. The, uh, in a snow plow, you would be amazed at the tech technology that they have on their dashboard. Um, to look at, the, at what's happening on the road temperatures, the air temperatures, what's going on. And I know that Crow Wing County has found that they have really um, used uh, much less salt because of using this technology. And of course, on the bottom line, salt is expensive. And so it's helped them in their budgeting, which is why I think they're really focused on getting this training out every single year. Uh, with that, I have several testifiers that will uh, tell you what uh, we've been um, doing on this and we're going um, and I'll take up I think we have three chairs there so if Sue and Connie and maybe Abby would come up and Mr. Chair I think I'm overstepping no problem <laughs> uh, very good welcome to the committee and uh, first, we will turn to uh, Sue Nissen. Please identify yourself for the record. You may proceed. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Sue Nissen. Um, I want to thank you, Senator Rood, for proposing this important legislation. Um, I'm a Minnesota water steward, and I'm a citizen volunteer with Stop Over Salting. We're here in support of Senate File 2768 because it's good for clean water, infrastructure, business, and it maintains public safety. Ms. And Nissen, may I, may I bother you to move the pail quickly? It sort of interferes with the picture oh, of you. Oh, wow. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, and here's why I told you all the reasons we think it's a good bill. So now I do need to reference this, but you notice I've got a five gallon 
Home Depot bucket here and a teaspoon. So the spoon and pail demonstrate the pollution uh, power of a small amount of de-icer. One teaspoon dissolves five, dissolved in five gallons of fresh water brings that to the EPA standard of toxicity for aquatic life. We can't remove it. Dissolved de-icers are too expensive and impractical to get out of our water, so they become a permanent part of it. Our waters are becoming saltier and saltier, and we don't see salty water because it looks clear, but the data is in, as Senator Rood said, we've got 50 water bodies above the EPA impairment standard. We've got 75 more to tip over that we know of, I would say. And um, upward chloride trends in drinking water monitoring wells and in groundwater. Also chloride is highly destructive to our infrastructure. Damage per ton is around 800 to $3,000 in a ton and annual road salt usage is estimated right now at 400,000 tons in the state. And that's a lot of teaspoons of de-icer. Stop over salting volunteers. What we do is we frequently talk with commercial applicators and property managers. Many are not trained in best practice and overwhelmingly, there's a belief that visible salt on a property provides protection from slip and fall lawsuits. And that combination is really driving application. We also taught, we, they, those applicators are acutely aware of chloride damage. They tell us stories, they love their lakes, they love to fish. They are really frustrated with infrastructure damage, um, landscape repairs, crumbling sidewalks and businesses. However, at the end of the day, those same applicators need to protect their small businesses and currently over applying is what does that. So the opportunity for the liability protection in this bill is an incentive for commercial applicators to enroll in MPCA's highly effective smart salting training. It's a voluntary program it teaches science-based best practice. We attend, SOSers attend the trainings too, and we see applicators returning to their companies with expanded knowledge and, and they're really enthusiastic about a de-icer reduction because they know they can do that and maintain public safety. And a great example of change after training is Mayo Clinic, who reported a 60% reduction in the year that they tra train, right after they train, and that was a year of record amounts of snow. We have a vision uh, for Minnesota that every teaspoon of de-icer counts in a positive way uh, for public safety without waste. This bill is a real and necessary step in that direction. Please support uh, 2768. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Nissen. Any questions, uh, members? I don't see any on the... Um on the screen from those who are participating remotely. Sandra Sinja. Uh, Mr. Chair, would you just like questions on the bill now or just to what, what her testimony is or was? Uh, I, why don't, as long as she's at the table, why don't you ask them now? Unless you have something for one of the other testifiers. It, it might even be more for the author, but uh, okay. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I read about the, the commercial applicator uh, and yet we know, I think we all know, unless I'm completely wrong, there are a lot of applications done by government to, to roads and, and streets and roads and so on and so forth. Uh, our street, so the question is, are, are, are government uh, applicators exempt from this? Uh, Ms. Because, because I don't believe they're Ms. commercial applicators. Ms. Nissen or, or, yeah. or Senator Rudd? Uh, whoever may be able to answer that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Sengem, yes, this is for the commercial sector. And so, thank you, Ms. Ms. Hitt. So, commercial, they would be people that, for instance, would do a, a, a parking lot in a mall or, a, I don't know, perhaps a public school parking lot or that kind of applicator? Correct. Okay. Thank and the you. bill covers the applicator and the property managers that hire them. Okay. Thank you. And I have one more, but I'll wait. Okay. Mr. Chair, members, uh, Ben Stanley, Committee Council. If you look on the third page of the bill uh, on line 17 and 18, there's a section that says nothing in this section affects municipal liability under section 466.03. Uh, 
that section deals with uh, municipal liability for this same sort of thing. So the bill only deals with commercial applicators, but there are other statutes that deal with municipal actors. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Senzo. Just, just to follow up, make sure I heard. So a municipal or state governments have a separate applica or application standards relative to SALT. Is, is that what you told me? Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, uh, that's correct. It's not quite uh, structured the same way that this, this training and certification regime is. The uh, language in 466.03, for example, is an exception to the uh, general uh, situation where 466.02 makes municipalities liable for tort claims, except in certain cases. And 466.03 makes clear that one of those cases where they're not liable is for conditions related to snow and ice cover. So it's structured more as an exception to the overarching tort claims regime for municipal government. So it's not a municipal governments aren't getting certified like commercial applicators would under this bill. It's just a general statement of when local governments are liable under the tort claims statutes. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we will turn to our next testifier who is Connie Fortin of, of Bolton and Mank, and she is participating through Zoom. Uh, please identify yourself for the record, uh, Ms. Fortin, and you may proceed. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair and Senators. I'm very happy to be here today to testify on behalf of this legislation. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to also uh, comment on the previous question. And please identify yourself for the record. Oh, Connie Fortin. Senior Project Manager, Bolton and Mink. Very good, thank you. Live, yep, live in Medina, Minnesota. Um, the previous question, as far as application rates in the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency training class, which I've designed and I teach, we recommend the same application rates for private and public entities. It's not a requirement, it's a goal, and there's factors that vary, but we're giving both the same message. Um, a little background about myself. I've spent 25 years working on chloride reduction strategies. I've developed and taught the smart salting classes for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I've written the manuals that uh, accompany the training. Over the course of the past 15 years, I've been in front of about 20,000 winter maintenance professionals teaching them ways to be smarter in their salting practices. I'm viewed as a leader on chloride reform in the United States. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is also viewed as a leader in smart salting across the United States. We are highly respected with our proactive work on chloride awareness and reduction. So we're in the lead. Okay, the other thing that has happened to put Minnesota in the lead is the MPCA last year released a statewide chloride management plan asking every person in our state to reduce chloride use. All the other cold weather states are watching us take the lead. So now it's time, I think, for our elected officials to help us with this. We need help getting the private side of winter maintenance, uh, the opportunity to be trained, and the incentive to have reduced liability if they use sensible salting practices, okay? So our estimates in the Twin Cities metro area, our seven most populated count, uh, counties, is that the salt use between MnDOT, the counties, the cities, and the private sector is about equal, meaning they're about one fourth of the total salt load that goes down. The cities, the counties, and the state have taken quicker action to reduce their salt use. And we can see this because the United States Geological Survey in their most recent groundwater report has shown that our groundwater contamination, the rate of our groundwater contamination has dropped. 
And when we compare that to the eastern part of the United States, their rate of groundwater contamination is still increasing. Okay. But the private sector is lagging behind. We need help getting them on board. So what I would ask you is let's support the training program. Let's support the limited liability. Once they come through training, they perfectly well know what to do to reduce their salt use. And they know it'll work. Mayo Clinic is an excellent example as soon as Nissen testified. But they are fearful and they overapply. You can check this out. When you leave today, you look at the sidewalk in front of the Senate building and tell me how much salt is there. And is it necessary? It isn't necessary. <laughs> so I think that you can do a lot to help us move this forward. Um, I would say thank you for your good work, for being leaders in our community. We have 10,000 reasons to pass this legislation. And I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Horton. Any, uh, any questions, members? Senator Herr. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Weber and Chair Root and Sen Senator Root. Uh, I was taken by surprise when I look at the names of the testifier and um, Ms. Fulton and I crossed paths in the past and Senator Root, you're not the only one that had to take class on, uh, on uh, salt uh, applicator certification. I am one of them too. I, I got my certificate 12 years ago and it's when I crossed paths with Ms. Fulton here, I did a PowerPoint for her. so. Uh, that's how I brought in. So I, I'm glad to see her, and she's actually a, a you know, guru in this area of expertise. Um, I'm going to go on to a question. Maybe it could be answered now or at some point later, uh, where our agency, MPCA, are, are, are they part of this um, uh, legislation um, as, as well, or is this an a, uh, uh, independent um, proposal. Um, I might have been one of the early author of this legislation, like maybe 2017 or so. And so this is a um, good proposal, good legislation to support. Just want to state, but my question is, I want to know where our agency and PCA stand on this. Thank you. Okay, is someone from the agency here? Yes, Senator Ruth. Uh, I believe they are online, if they would. If... Okay. Chair Weber and uh, members of the committee, we have uh, myself and uh, Dave Benke, who's the uh, Resource Management and Assistance Division Director. So I'll, I'll defer to, uh, to Dave on this one. Very good. Please identify yourself for the record, uh, Mr. Benke, and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I raised my hand, but I should raise it higher next time so we can <laughs> get to it. Thanks for al allowing us to participate virtually. And thank you for uh, Senator Rood and, and uh, the legislation here. This is really important for uh, reducing salt in, in uh, our lakes and rivers and streams here in, in the state. Um, we recognize the uh, toxic nature of salt and its permanence. And so I think that's one thing that we really got to try and get a handle on is how we reduce that um, and make sure we're still safe uh, with our roads and, and travel, um, but also make sure that our waters are protected. So you asked the question about, uh, is this an agency bill? It is not. Um, this is a separate uh, bill, but the agency uh, would like to recognize the importance of uh, this and also the connection to the smart salting uh, training that uh, we currently do. Um, I think a question was asked earlier about who's participating in the training. And just to add to that, over 80% of the uh, folks who come to the training are from government. Uh, so we've got a good handle on uh, government coming to the training, um, but there's opportunity uh, with the commercial uh, applicators that are out there. And it's been a little challenging to get them to the courses. And so I think this legislation provides that opportunity to do that. So I'll, uh, be available for any other questions that folks might have. Thank you, Mr. Banky. Senator Herr? Uh, no follow-up question, but I, I just think that this is a good legislation. Thank you. 
I just like to mention to those of you that are participating remotely, uh, please use the raise hand function. Uh, it's, it is difficult to keep track of everyone and everything while we're going through this hybrid uh, process. So thank you very much. Uh, if there are no further questions uh, at this point, our next testifier is Abby Moore from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. And uh, Ms. El Sadi, you are on deck. If you are here, you may approach uh, the testifier's table and, um, and be seated. And then, uh, and then at this point, we'll proceed with Ms. Moore. Please identify yourself. Mr. Thank Chair, you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Ruth. Um, I think uh, b before Ms. Nissen leaves the um, testifier's table, um, if the pages would come up, um, I, I believe she has something for, for each member of our uh, committee. And um, so if you would like to hand them out for, for Ms. Nissen, that would be fine. Um, this is kind of a symbol of the stopover salting, and it reminds us all of the one teaspoon of salt uh, permanently pollutes five gallons of water. So um, uh, they are kind of fun to have in your office, and um, they're very decorative if you'd like to wear them. <laughs> Uh, thank you, and Ms. Nissen, and e yeah, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Senator. Ms. Moore. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Abby Moore, and I'm an outreach specialist at the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. As we know, uh, a single teaspoon of salt contains enough chloride to permanently pollute five gallons of fresh water. Currently in the Twin Cities metro area, we're applying around 365,000 tons of salt on our roads and paved surfaces every year. An estimated 78% of that salt will eventually find its way into our groundwater supplies or into our surface waters, where it is toxic to fish and other aquatic life. Unfortunately, much of our road salt is wasted, used in greater quantities than is needed or used in the wrong conditions. We call this oversalting, and contrary to popular belief, more salt does not equal safer roads or sidewalks. It only means an excess of harmful chemicals impacting our water quality for generations to come. The antidote to oversalting is smart salting. At the MWMO, we work with our local and state partners to sponsor smart salting training for public and private snow removal professionals. This training not only reduces the problem of oversalting, it also helps our salt applicators to become more effective, leading to improved public safety outcomes as well as cost savings. The availability and accessibility of this smart salting training is critical to reducing the harmful impacts of chloride while maintaining safety on our roadways. We ask for your support in providing more training opportunities to our snowplow drivers and snow removal contractors. We also need your support in relieving the burden of liability from those who are certified smart salters using best practices. We know from experience working with public work staff, snow removal contractors, and business owners that they know what to do and want to help, but they worry about lawsuits from patrons who demand they blanket even dry pavement with salt granules, believing falsely that this increases safety. If current trends continue, researchers have projected that some water bodies in the metro area may no longer be able to support aquatic life by 2050. You can help reverse these trends today by supporting Senate File 2768. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now turn to Nadia Alsadi from the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy and Ms. Sietzma from the city of Wilmer, you would be on deck. Thank you, Chair Weber, and thank you, Senator Rood, for taking a proactive approach to curbing the increasing problem of salt pollution in Minnesota water bodies. My name is Nadia Alsadi. I am the Water Policy Associate at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, a nonprofit organization with almost 50 years of experience using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment. MCEA supports this bill, SF2768, to take measured yet significant steps towards addressing this environmental problem. Salt pollution is a problem throughout the state and particularly in areas with high impervious surface cover. Chlorides from de-icers and salts can be a problem with stormwater runoff and can accumulate in lakes, streams, and groundwater. Once chlorides have entered a water body, there is no practical way to remove it. 
This is a problem for all of Minnesota, which currently has 50 chloride impaired water bodies with 75 more considered high risk. This bill protects Minnesota water bodies from further salt pollution by providing incentives for salt applicators to receive formal training on smart salting procedures. This bill will help advance public education as it relates to these issues. The smart salting training that has been offered and provided through the MPCA and Fortin Consulting is an effective tool for educating maintenance professionals on smart salting practices. As a previous Green Corps member with the MPCA, I participated in this training as some of you have as well, and gained valuable knowledge and practical safe and cost-effective ways to reduce salt overuse and pollution. The SMART salting training describes the impacts of the overuse of salt on our roadways and sidewalks. It only takes one teaspoon of salt to permanently pollute five gallons of water. The SMART salting training also describes how the use of salt on particularly colder days is far less impactful and how more efficient snow management may be more cost effective. Unless we take proactive measures on the front end by providing education to salt applicators and maintenance professionals, more of Minnesota's prized waters will become impaired. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that salt is widely overused and overapplied in Minnesota. The permanent impacts from this overuse is a problem that must be addressed now. I encourage everyone to consider smarter, smarter salting practices and training and to address this, this issue in part by moving this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. El Sadi. Any questions for Ms. El Sadi? Seeing none, we will then thank you. So we will turn to our, our final scheduled testifier, Sarah Sietzma, Environmental Specialist, City of Wilmer. Welcome and please identify yourself for the record. I'm Sarah Sietzma. I am the Environmental Specialist for the City of Wilmer. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Sietzema. I'm the Environmental Specialist for the City of Wilmer. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 2768. I'm here to testify on behalf of my city, as well as the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. The coalition is a group of more than 100 cities throughout the state. The CGMC and the city support Senate File 2768 for the purpose of reducing salt pollution in our waters. The city of Wilmer and the other CGMC cities play an essential role in protecting Minnesota's waters through our wastewater and stormwater treatment systems. In Wilmer, like many other cities across Minnesota, we deal with high levels of salty parameters in our waters, and we seek opportunities to partner in efforts to reduce such pollution. High levels of chloride are harmful to aquatic plants and animals and may also impact groundwater used for drinking. Chloride and other salts can damage treatment infrastructure as well. Cities spend tens of thousands of dollars annually to replace corroded pipes and impellers and crumbling concrete sidewalks and water control structures. Unlike nutrients such as phosphorus or nitrogen, chloride permanently pollutes our water because there is no cost effective or easy method to remove it. Road salt has been identified as one of the primary causes for the increased chloride in Minnesota's waters. Because it is not feasible to remove chloride from wastewater and stormwater, the best way to address this issue is by preventing it from reaching our water in the first place. Senate File 2768 is an important first step that will assist in reducing the amount of de-icing salt used on parking lots and sidewalks, help the businesses in our communities implement best management practices, and result in cleaner waters across Minnesota, all without sacrificing public safety. I thank you again for the opportunity to support this legislation. While it will not solve this issue in its entirety, we believe it is a common sense solution that will promote immediate investment to protect Minnesota's surface and groundwaters in an affordable way. We ask that you adopt this legislation. Very good, thank you, Ms. Sietzma. Uh, is there any, are there any questions for Ms. Sietzma? And uh, is there anyone else that wishes to testify? Or is there a question over there? Senator Sinsham, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'm just not, I'm not sure where I direct this. So I'm just gonna ask the question and anybody can, anybody can answer. So, so I read on line one, six, this is, this is a voluntary program. Uh, uh, the certification is a voluntary program yet uh, if you want to volunteer and do it, uh, 
there's a charge no more than three hundred and fifty dollars uh, to be a certified commercial applicator. Uh, what is the incentive for somebody to do to be a certified commercial applicator? If I mean, there, it seems to me the fee is a disincentive. I, I'm trying to understand this, and, and, and let me just take one step further. Would would, for instance, say, uh, you know, we have people in Rochester that that you know have have snow blowers on trailers and and go around and maybe after the snowfall do maybe 20 houses and maybe we'll, you know sprinkle some salt on the front step and the driveway and and maybe even out to the sidewalk uh, uh, would those folks be need to be sort of it's voluntary so they wouldn't have to be certified commercial applicators is that is that am i right there Sen they senator could if they root. wanted to be senator root will respond senator root uh, senator Senjum, we have been operating this program for i believe two years maybe three under grants that we have received so that uh, we didn't have to charge for people to run through the certification program. And those grants are currently running out, I believe, as of this, this um, snow cycle. And so um, in order to, to um, continue educating folks um, to become certified, um, we will need to charge uh, in the future. And so we, we think the, the 350, although I'm not, um, I think there's a fiscal note for that, um, maybe in your packet. Um, and so that that's why we now have to charge for this program because the grants have run out. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, could I just follow up either with you or Mr. Stanley? So Senator uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, to the, to the person with the, uh, you know, uh, 20 sidewalks to snow blow and, and they carry a couple bags of salt and they, they you know, they sprinkle the sidewalk and the, the front step and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but would that person be motivated to be a commercial applicator? <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Rood. And Senator Sinjum, I think you'll see uh, part of the bill uh, talks about liability when you have had this certification. Right. And so um, that is one of the uh, caveats of taking it is you be certified and uh, the intent is uh, to limit the liability should there be a slippage or falling on your property. And that's why you would want to become a certified, other than it's just good uh, yeah. stewardship of the environment, but that's the caveat. And I think you'll find that on page two. Right, I saw that. I, I... And, um, and that portion of the bill will be, um, this bill has a, has a journey. It, it needs to go to the environment finance because there is a fiscal note and it will also go to civil law. And, and I do believe in civil law, they'll be discussing the liability uh, portion of the bill. So Madam Chair, just to understand. So if you are certified, if you are that person with the snowblower and three bags of salt, uh, and, and if you are certified, then you are in a, a lesser, level of liability uh, if you if you are certified is that is that kind senator of what this says? I, mr chair and senator Senjum, that is the goal okay, That's the goal. okay. I, I believe <laughs> ms ms horton wishes to weigh in on this issue also ms horton uh senator and uh, thank you for letting me comment on that um certainly there should be an incentive for all the private sector to protect themselves uh, from liability. But uh, the fee, what we've seen and what we hope to see is organizations like Abby Moore's um, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization step up and help uh, sometimes defray the cost from those small applicators by, by hosting a class for many of them. So I feel that Anybody in our state should have an opportunity to attend the training um, and hopefully we'll find a way to make it affordable and beneficial for everybody. I think that we've seen great teamwork and ingenuity so far and I feel like you'll give us a better opportunity uh, moving forward if you can pass this legislation. Uh, Senator Senjo. Chair, I, I, I'm not opposed to the legislation. I, uh, I mean, I, I probably need it myself. You know, we have a bag of salt in the garage. And so, uh, so we probably all need it. Uh, I, I just, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, just uh, at what scale it, it, it is. And uh, I'm also kind of wondering how the, you know, how the person with those uh, 
20 uh, snowplow there's you know snowblower uh, clients uh, how even knows about or she as a case might be knows about uh, the class uh, is it is it part of vocational technical education in, in, in high schools or or part me the adult education or anything like that or is it just word of mouth Senator Root. Mr. Chair and Senator Sinjim, uh, there is a large uh, website that people can go to for all sorts of information on this. And also one of the things that we maybe have not stressed enough is the uh, monetary. Um, so the class costs you three, $350 to, um, to go to the class. Um, the value in, um, I know, especially for like Crow Wing County, they have seen the incredible savings um, that they have um, that they have because they don't use so much salt because the salt is put on the road exactly the amount and when it is supposed to. And so they have uh, saved thousands of dollars by not by using salt in the correct manner. And I would expect that it would be the same for a small company um, when they take and they know exactly what to put on there. Um, you use so much less salt than what we think we need that the, the cost savings for not using that, I really think pay for themselves and pay for the class. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rood, I, I mean, I, I don't turn core with the bill. I mean, where I live, every every uh, gram of salt put on a sidewalk or any, anywhere else is probably going to make its way to the Zumbro River, and that's that's really not a good thing where I live. And so, and I think that's be similar in every most most communities that have rivers. Of course, uh, you have lakes, but well, you have rivers as well. <laughs> but, Mr. Chair and I mean, Senator uh, Sendum, I have a few hundred miles of the Mississippi River in my district, right. so I, I think I think I have the river thing figured out. <laughs> well, it, uh, you know, it's all important, and uh, you know, I hope this bill can, you know, move this initiative forward. All right, very good. Thank you, Senator Sendum. If there are no further questions or items of discussion, members, anything else? Seeing nothing, uh, Senator Rood, would you like to move, uh, make the motion to move the bill to environment finance? Yes, Mr. Chair. Senator Rood moves that Senate file 2768 as amended be re referred to the environment finance. Excuse, excuse me, I missed a hand up here. Oh, Senator McEwen, sorry about that. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Senator. I, I, I just had some very brief comments and I appreciate you just taking a quick moment here. I just wanted to um, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for bringing this bill forward and thank, thank all of the people who have done work on this bill. Um, it, it sounds like a, a really great piece of legislation was put together um, with a lot of cooperation from a lot of different people. And it's just great to see. So I just wanted to to say thank you for that. And I know the people in my district are, are, are really clued into how we can make sure that we keep our waters clean. And this is, this is a key piece. So thank you so much. Thank you. With that, Senator Rood renews her motion to uh, that we pass uh, Senate file 2768 as amended and be, have it re-referred to the Environment Finance Committee. Please members, for those of you participating remotely, make sure that your video is on as well as your uh, as you're unmuted, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. The bill is passed and hereby re referred. Uh, with that, we will turn to Senate file 2769, Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, over the years, we've really uh, worked hard on tourism. And uh, I brought a few things uh, with me uh, today just to, um, just because they're kind of fun to remember. But um, I will show you this picture. And in 2003, we created the Explore Minnesota Tourism Council. And it was a joint effort by Senator Bach and myself. And uh, Governor Plenty uh, and um, John Edmond of Explore Minnesota Tourism and a group of us flew up to Bemidji and we signed the bill with Paul Bunyan's pencil. And um, it was a, a really fun event. And from there, we've really uh, come a long way with tourism, um, realizing what an important, important um, uh, economic engine is for the state of Minnesota. And so I also brought with me today the very first cereal box. And this is from 2004. And uh, it's, it's really uh, a wonderful 
um, tourism tool. It has all the facts. And I think one day it'd be kind of fun to look at this box and the box that is coming out uh, in a few weeks and to see where we've come and how, how wisely we've spent the money uh, on tourism to um, uh, help the businesses and um, help Minnesota grow. So with that today, we have Senate file 26, 2769, and I have a few folks, uh, oops, Sen Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator Rood. Uh, we have uh, the first three individuals to testify are Sarah Pisick, Rachel Thompson, and Terry Matson. if you would approach the table. Ms. Pasek, we will start with you. Please identify yourself and you may proceed. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Sarah Pasek and I represent the Minnesota Tourism Growth Coalition. We're a statewide group of public, private, nonprofit tourism organizations and businesses. First, we wanna thank Senator Rood for her years and years of support for tourism and tourism funding, and also our co-authors for sponsoring Senate File 2769. The tourism and hospitality industry was the first sector shut down at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And while there's been some recovery in the industry, that recovery has not been consistent. There have been multiple starts and stops and recovery is not even across the state or across tourism sectors. And full recovery will take several years. We know that the success of the tourism and hospitality industry plays a strong role in the success of a local community and the entire state. Local, regional, and state taxes provide support for community services. Increased tourism activity benefits local bars and restaurants, gas stations, grocery stores, theaters, event planners, stage crews, printing shops, outdoor recreation providers, and I could go on and on. As Senator Rood mentioned, the popular Explore Minnesota cereal boxes will arrive at your desks and in your offices later this month. But on that box, you'll see information about how the industry has suffered economically during the pandemic, including information that's broken down by county. Information from Explore Minnesota shows that Minnesota's tourism industry has suffered nearly $12 billion in travel spending losses since 2019. Leisure and hospitality gross sales fell from 16.6 billion in 2019 to 11.7 billion in 2020. State sales tax collections fell from 1.1 billion in 2019 to 731 million in 2020. And jobs in these categories are down by approximately 70,000 workers. The bill under consideration today, Senate File 2769, would direct $6 million in one-time funding to a tourism industry recovery grant program. The grant program will, will flow through Explore Minnesota and 100% of the funds go, will go directly toward accelerating tourism recovery. The grants will be used primarily to support meetings, conventions and group business, multi-community and high visibility events and tourism marketing. It's important to note that no other state agency serves the needs of Minnesota's destination marketing organizations, event organizers, or the meetings industry with a grant program. And so this request does not overlap with any existing programs at Explore Minnesota either. In 2021, the legislature appropriated $750,000 for a tourism grant recovery program. And I wanna thank you for that. But I also want you to know that Explore Minnesota reported that those funds were consumed within eight hours of opening the application period. Approximately 50 grants were awarded at the level between $10,000 and $20,000. So clearly there's a need for this funding and we know it will be put to use quickly and it will make an impact across the state and in local communities. In your packet, you have a letter of support from Hospitality Minnesota, but I want to turn things over to the testifiers who can tell you their perspective on tourism from various parts of the state, and we'll all be available to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pasek. Um, with that, uh, <laughs> if I don't see any questions right now, we will turn to Rachel Thompson from Visit Greater St. Cloud. She is participating remotely 
And uh, please, uh, you may identify yourself for the record and you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rachel Thompson and I am the executive director at Visit Greater St. Cloud, which is the destination marketing management organization for the cities of St. Cloud, White Park and the surrounding communities in central Minnesota. I'm here fully supporting the Minnesota Senate file 2769. It is imperative to destination management organizations like mine and the communities that we represent to get this appropriation. These recovery dollars directly impact the recovery and the hospitality sector businesses that were hit the hardest in the last two years. As of January 27th, 2022, U.S. Travel Association reported that the Minnesota tourism industry has suffered nearly $12 billion in travel spending losses since 2019. Those losses are not going to be recovered without substantial support like those from the entities of Explore Minnesota Tourism and the appropriations these individual CVB budgets, like mine, are largely tied to hotel motel lodging tax and have been severely impacted by the decrease in travel and tourism due to the pandemic and its ongoing impacts um, in the travel and the event industry. Visit Greater St. Cloud operated at a level of 28.4% decreased budget in 2021 and is still projected to be 28% down in revenues in 2022 compared to 2019 levels. From this, the 53.2 decrease in 2020 lodging collections, you can see that the industry has made advances in tourism recovery, but there's still a great way to go. This recovery is greatly attributed to the past one-time appropriation from Explore Minnesota Tourism that you all graciously gave um, and the grant opportunities from their organization. The last recovery appropriation that was received has been noted that it was gone within eight hours. One important piece to mention within that was it was opened at midnight. <laughs> and so many destinations like myself woke up in the middle of the evening, set alarms to make sure that our application would be submitted because of the importance to receive those dollars. It clearly is a, a great need as we continue forward in our recovery. These grants allow for destinations like myself to execute ad placements, target niche marketing approaches, win event contracts, and fulfill marketing plans necessary for obtaining travel to their region. For every dollar invested in Minnesota tourism marketing, it returns an estimated $180 in spending by travelers and $18 in state and local taxes. Those additional taxes raised also residually help our communities. Visit Greater St. Cloud was fortunate enough to be one of those recipients and received $20,000 in the last recovery grant. We received those funds and we were able to um, attain over 500,000 impressions on banner ads placed during traveling um, for outdoor seasonal activities. We ran an ad in the Minnesota Travel e-newsletter for February and May, and we contracted a local video and production of photography company, which was a nine month contract. It included six videos, as well as 12 short social format videos and photos from attractions. Um, There's about 30 uh, different attractions. So in total, we received over 200 photos in addition to that video content. That was all from my destination alone, not including the other um, grants that were received to the other destinations. These new assets that we received are invaluable as they are the first thing that potential travelers and event planners see as they're looking to gain travel in inspiration. The contents that we had prior was extremely limited and the rights that we were able to use for them was simply outdated. The Explore Minnesota Tourism Recovery Grant Program funded with the appropriation would aid in bridging the gap that are currently we are having with financial tax collection and would provide a resource for um, recovery directly for the promotion and support of tourism in all of our great Minnesota destinations. It is my, de uh, my recommendation and plea really to move Senate file 2769 forward. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, Dex, we will turn to our next testifier and that is uh, Terry Matson from Visit St. Paul. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, my name is Terry Matson. I'm the president and CEO of Visit St. Paul and the River Center here in our capital city. It's great seeing you all in person. Uh, actually kind of fun, so thank you for the opportunity. I also serve on the Explore Minnesota Tourism Council where I chair the Public Policy Committee. I'm also president of the Minnesota Tourism Growth Coalition. Please join me in supporting Senate File 2769, a one-time pass-through $6 million tourism industry recovery grant program. Thank you, Senator Rood, for and the co-authors for bringing this bill forward. As the Metro Council representative at Explore Minnesota, I have immense firsthand experience and knowledge on just how devastating the past years, the past two years have been to the Metro. Also, I'm perhaps uh, a bit uniquely qualified uh, as a presenter, having a background in greater Minnesota tourism with nearly three decades of previous experience as the CEO of Duluth Tourism. Minnesota tourism was and still is deeply impacted uh, by the global pandemic. The pain is widespread. The comeback curve swings widely depending on where you are in Minnesota. Recovery is disparate depending on who you are. While some have gained momentum, there are still many, many challenges and, certainty and uncertainties for all of us. The situation in the Minneapolis-St. Paul market remains very desperate. Typically, 70% of Minnesota's overall tourism sales are generated in the metro. That's a big number, but it's also very fragile. Those revenues still remain down by a half or more. I'll share with you some specific examples in St. Paul. Typically, Ramsey County tourism generates about 2.3 billion in sales and directly supports some 30,000 jobs. The immediate St. Paul area has lost more than a billion dollars in sales and 70 million in related tax revenues, along with losing 15 to 20,000 jobs. Downtown St. Paul hotel occupancy um, used to be consistently in the mid 60 percentiles. In 2020, it was 25%. In 2021, it was 32%. Today, maybe it's 40%. The related dramatic loss of hotel motel tax revenues has devastated funding sources for organizations such as Visit St. Paul, where our funding has dropped 70%. We've implemented massive budget reductions and dramatically adjusted staffing. And we pivot time and time again to continue our important work all destinations need this grant program to attract new meetings, conventions, and events, and to attract visitors across multiple segments who access our resources and media to plan their travel from online to print, social media, and digital influences. The improvements in COVID transmission are driving improvements in traveler sentiment, and marketability is improving. While these improvements have been made, Make no mistake that return to a sense of normalcy still appears elusive. Destination promotion is for the benefit of every person in Minnesota. It is an essential high return investment to develop opportunities and build quality of life. We're really in the best market position right now since COVID began, yet in many ways the worst because of such depleted financial resources that frankly won't recover for years. St. Paul will not fully recover without tourism and tourism won't recover without Visit St. Paul. I need your help and so do leaders across the state. As primary drivers of tourism's economic benefits, we need to be in the best position to attract visitors as soon as possible. The stakes have never been higher than they are right now for the long-term health of our economy. We can build back better with your support, getting visitors moving again safely will in turn get the Metro moving again. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Rood and others. I encourage you to also enthusiastically support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Matson. And our final testifier is Mike Schweders from Boyd Laws of Cross Lake, Minnesota. Welcome, uh, please identify yourself for the record. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mike Schweders. I am from Boyd Lodge up in Cross Lake. And I have the, also the privilege of being the president of the Community of Minnesota Resort Association, which represents approximately 130 of the mom and pop 
mainly mom and pop resorts uh, in Minnesota. Everything you've heard so far from all the other testifiers is absolutely true. Uh, our segment probably has not been hit as bad as the larger hotel type styles, but any of our, any of my colleagues and those in my area, Cross Lake, you know, uh, Brainerd Lakes area, events that are large groups, weddings, bars, restaurants, all of those players in our regions have been adversely affected and have not recovered as quickly as we personally have in the resort business. I'm lucky. I did not have a restaurant. I did not have a bar. I just had lodging. However, those that did, I have colleagues that have restaurants up in uh, the Bemidji area. They closed them for parts of their week because they couldn't, they, they just didn't have the people there to, to fulfill the, the staff that they needed to keep them open. These things are still going on. They are improving, yes, that is true. However, we also are seeing an influx of ads from the areas like Wisconsin Dells, the Dakotas, all of those areas are looking at the same thing. It's like, this business is starting to come back. We need to go after those guests that are looking for places to travel. This extra money, this one-time uh, portion would generate opportunities to go out and reach those folks that we are waiting anxiously to come back to our establishments, to come into our restaurants, into our bars, into our hotels. We, so I ask you personally as well, on behalf of all of my colleagues in the resort community, to please favorably look at this bill. It does make a difference. It's an investment. It's not an expenditure because those monies come back. We've heard the testimonies, the, the dollars that we're talking, you know, a minimum of $18 in tax revenue for a dollar spent. And in those communities where I live that are smaller communities, those monies just keep rotating through and through and through in our communities. It is an extremely important thing to consider. And I thank you for your time and it'll entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Members, uh, Senator Herr, and then Senator Sosinski. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Chair Weber. Um, I, I know this is a non-controversial bill, um, but I do have a question uh, uh, where it will be traveling next. And um, also, it's also without a house companion. That's my question. But um, I want to make a little pers you know, uh, personal comment as well. You know, um, and like to compliment Senator Rood, uh, before I served in the Senate, I was wonder, we have such a, um, let's see, nature wonder up in Northern Minnesota. And I was always wonder how we can generate um, income uh, revenue and also bring tourists to charge our economy uh, tourists from all over the world to see our natural wonder up north. And I was surprised when I get to the Senate this is, uh, nine years ago already to see that there already is an agency like Explore Minnesota. And so Senator Root, I'm glad to see a pioneer in the midst too. Uh, you show a picture of you earlier. Um, and I'm glad to see the testifier from different part of our state and especially um, Mr. Terry Matson, who worked with Visit, Visit St. Paul, and I want to compliment your good work. You know, you know, I want to add a few stars to your great work. Um, and I know that you work with many agency and also many events and many venues, but I want to note uh, one thing that despite the loss of tourism and economic and the metro um, last year, uh, when you know we have our ghost gold medalist Sunisa Lee, you know coming home in a matter of just few days, uh, Visit St. Paul was able to organize and has very great turnout um, that attract folks from South South Dakota, North Dakota, Illinois coming over. So I want to take this time to compliment their work and effort uh, of Visit St. Paul. Uh, so now. Um, but that I just want to go back to the original question that where this bill is traveling to and how will it do with our house companion. Uh, Senator Herr, this bill would be voted on today to proceed to the Environment Natural Resources Finance Committee. 
Uh, as relates to the house situation, Senator Rood. Mr. Chair and Senator Herr, um, thank you. Um, the companion bill will be introduced, I believe, on Monday in the House. It's all ready to go. It's just, you know how it is. It's hard to get jackets between the bodies. And um, I think there's a gremlin that runs the tunnels now to get the jackets back and forth. So um, <laughs> so we're just a little late on getting on getting that over to the House. But I believe it'll be in on Monday. And um, I, I really liked your comments about what's happening in, in St. Paul, because when we think of tourism, we sometimes only think of bringing um, tourisms up north, uh, bring them to Duluth, bring them to my area, my and in my district. But I think that's um, really kind of a misnomer because we spend a tremendous amount of money um, bringing tourists to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And uh, one of the biggest tourist attractions is the Mall of America right here in the cities. And so I think uh, the Explore Minnesota Tourism does a, you know, it's it's got members from all over the state and every different um, type of tourism. So it really is um, for the whole state of Minnesota. And I, and I really um, like the fact that you saw that um, when they were able to put together an event so quickly right here in, in the Twin Cities. So thank you for that. You good, Senator Her? No, I'm good. Okay, good. Senator Sosinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Rood, for bringing this bill forward. Any investment in um, getting people outside and exploring this wonderful state is, is money well spent. But my, my question is there's on line one, two, it says must not retain any portion for administrative costs. I'm just wondering how Edu or Explore Minnesota will um, disperse six million dollars and have the op have the time and energy and effort to go through all the grant applications and maintain a balance between um, Greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities and and do all that work to disperse six million dollars without any administrative costs. It just seems like an undue burden upon um, a government agency to to put that onus or that burden upon them and unless I don't I don't know I'm just wondering if anybody's given that any thought thank you Ms. Pasek sure I'm happy to answer that and I'm not sure Explore Minnesota might be available online also but um yeah it looks like Lauren Bennett McGinty the new director raised her hand but I would just say um they're 100 percent on board for this but I should just let them speak since she raised her hand okay very good. Um, we will turn uh, to Explore Minnesota. Please identify yourself for the record. Hi there, my name is Lauren Bennett McGinty. I am the director of Explore Minnesota Tourism. And um, it is a great question how we will deal with the disbursement. Currently we have um, regional programs that work on dispersing the grants of about $3 million. and. Um, we can give larger grants as well if this $6 million um, were come, would come to pass. And then, of course, to support the larger and existing events and meetings and conventions and marketing, those would likely be larger than the standard grants that we've given in the past. So we do have a, a team ready to do that, and we do have experience doing that as well. Senator? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, seeing none at this point, um, we will turn to Senator Rood. Uh, would you like to make the motion to move the bill to environment finance? Thank you, Mr. Chair, I would. Senator Rood moves that Senate file 2769 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Environmental Finance Committee. Member of members online, be sure you are unmuted and, and on video. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. The bill is hereby passed and re-referred. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Weber. I'll, I'll take the gavel back. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Members, next up we have a Senate file uh, 908, Senator Weber. Senator Weber, would you like to be at the chair or would you like to stay where you're As at? As my testifier is going to be uh, through Zoom, I will maybe just stay sitting here. Perfect. Senator Weber, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if you're thinking you have seen this bill before, you are correct. Uh, we are giving it a rehearing. Uh, this bill was passed out of committee last year. Uh, however, it failed to uh, come out of the House 
And as uh, for those of you who have participated in conference committees, uh, usually the first things that hit the cutting room floor are those items that aren't found in both bills. And it's not that there was any controversy attached to this, they just simply didn't hear the bill last year. However, this year they, the bill has went through its first committee hearing in the House. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, we keep this front and center this year. I appreciate you, Madam Chair, hearing the bill. Uh, this addresses expenses associated with the cleanup of tax forfeited properties. And this has been a challenge for counties statewide. Uh, when taxes go unpaid on a property and it is, it is eventually turned over to the state. However, counties are the ones that are responsible for the administration and the costs of returning these properties uh, to productive taxable property or public use. Uh, if there are uh, contamination issues, they're responsible for the remediation of that. If there's, if they need to be, buildings need to be torn down, uh, they wind up uh, having to pay for that. And as a result, uh, when, if those properties are sold, um, they are not necessarily first in line for getting compensation for the expenses that they have outlaid. And so uh, at this point, we would like to mitigate that financial burden wherever possible and support more active attention to the properties in the program. Um, and so at this point, uh, I have a testifier, uh, Greg Bernou from Carleton County and he uh, can share more information with you. Thank you, Senator Weber. Um, is Mr. Benu? I'm sorry, they just kicked me offline. So um, is Mr. Benu online? Yes. All right, Mr. Benu, please uh, uh, identify yourself and uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Gregory Bernou. I'm the Land Commissioner for Carleton County. I manage the tax forfeited lands in Carleton County on behalf of the County Board. Um, I, I also belong to the Minnesota Association of County Land Commissioners. We stretch from at the south end Pine County, going all the way west towards Becker County, then north up to Lake of the Woods, then finally east over to Cook County and then back down encompassing 15 counties up here. The County Land Commissioners do support Senate File 0908. Uh, the rationale is that over a number of years, uh, Association of Minnesota Counties, which represents all 87 counties across the state of Minnesota through their district meetings, has identified blighted conditions and the cleanup of those blighted conditions within our counties as a tier one issue. Uh, so Minnesota Land Commissioners join forces with AMC to get legislation rolling on this. These Tax forfeited properties stretch from Traverse County on the knob of Minnesota all the way down to Hennepin from the lowest populated to the highest populated. And these properties also occur in the cities from Laverne all the way up to Angle Inlet in uh, Northwest Lake of the Woods County. The cleanup of these properties can raise from, range from thousands of dollars to the multitude of houses we have to clean up to the millions of dollars for some industrial Superfund sites. Um, when we clean up houses, and my personal experience has been to take care of uh, lead pipes, lead uh, paint, asbestos, both in the caulking around the windows and also on siding, uh, to formaldehydes in the carpets. And on a couple of occasions, I have had to bring in uh, hazmat teams to clean up uh, schedule one, two, three drugs and narcotics. Superfund sites could contain petroleums to tires to wrecked cars to a multitude of items. Um, the problem with this is that under the statutes we operate, the tax forfeited funds that we use to pay for these start the year at zero dollars in the account and by statute 22 have to end at zero dollars in the account. So we're on a year by year basis and to try to figure out funding for cleaning up thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars doesn't give us a lot of funding to do that. So this bill would allow us to create a special fund within 282 and clarify the ability for county boards to set aside money, a five-year program to stash money into these accounts prior to the apportionment out to the taxing districts. This would help us clean up those properties in our small cities where we have been seeing uh, uh, ex uh, an exodus of the population from small towns such as Crosby, such as um, Kettle River, such as Baudette to more major metropolitan areas. That's where our funding sources um, we need to have that grant. So um, anything that we can do to look at financing these 
properties outside of the tech or to carry more funds over to do it would greatly help us. There are some other funds available for some super fund sites, but they still are not enough to help the counties clean up these properties and return them either to the tax rolls or for a better and higher public use. So in closing, uh, the Minnesota County of Land Commissioners with support from the Association of Minnesota Counties do support Senate File 0908. And uh, as I testified earlier in the House hearings, um, thank you for your work on this and we look forward to, to progress. And I'll close now and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Benu. Members, are there questions? Senator Weber. Madam Chair, just one further comment I'd like to make. Uh, we had a situation in my district whereby a school district had passed a bond issue for a new high school. Uh, at that time, they had a potential uh, a buyer for the old high school, and it was sold to him. Uh, as time went on, however, he was not able to make his redevelopment plan work, and therefore he left the property to go back in lieu of taxes. Had it went forward with the bond issue, the school probably would have bonded additional dollars to provide for the demolition of the structure and, and what have you, and then had some saleable property in terms of bare land when it was done. But since it was a private owner in between and went back for taxes, now all of a sudden when it was time for uh, it to be uh, torn down, it became the responsibility of the county. Being an older school building with different additions, there was uh, asbestos, et cetera. And it was many hundreds of thousands of dollars later that the county had to expand, which the county had to expand in order to demolish this older property. And, and so it, it, it gets to be a true burden on, on our counties when they're responsible for having to do this. Thank you, Senator Weber. Are there other questions? Uh, with that, uh, Senator Weber, would you like to make a motion to send this bill to the floor? Uh, thank you, Chair Root. I would. Thank you. Senator Weber moves that Senate File 908 be recommended to pass and uh, move to the floor. Uh, members, uh, make sure that you have your videos on and your microphones on. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. The bill passes. Thank you, Senator Weber. Thank you. With that, members, uh, there's no other business before this committee. We are adjourned, and thank you all. Thank uh you. -huh.